a bit more of a base um, to all of you throughout the presentation. So thanks for making it uh, tonight and making it a priority and we're, and we're uh, really glad to do it. So thank you. Absolutely. And um, I know with many of you uh, coming in from home, we're also home. So if there is an interruption from kids or dogs or something, right. um, please be patient. Um, that, that may happen. Um, uh, I am, I was trained as a, a, a school psychologist um, and, uh, and got my clinical licensure. Uh, and I've worked uh, in three different states uh, and I've worked with IEP processes and 504 plans uh, in multiple settings, uh, public schools. Uh, I currently serve as the clinical lead of our diagnostics department. Um, and then uh, I've done um, a little bit of research with, with RTI and some of those components within the public schools. So I think this will guide you along the path. And I know that um, when we've done this presentation in, in, the, in the past, um, if you have specific questions, we will make our best attempts to answer them. Sometimes it is a little bit difficult um, not knowing when, when there are very specific questions, um, not knowing the full background, having uh, uh, information, uh, all the information on hand. With that being said, we also include our, our email addresses and if we can be assistance and, and get some additional information to kind of guide you along that path, uh, we'd be happy to do so. Absolutely. So, you ready, Colin? Yes, sir. All right. Oh. So, um, we begin with, you know, the self-advocacy and at Groves, such a big part of what we do is self-advocacy. We talk about it all the time with our lower school, middle school, and upper school students, um, helping them to understand that and, and to grow into that, to kind of understand who they are, how they learn best, um, their disability, whether that's appropriate for their age and where their parents are at um, and who their student is too, and understanding um, more self-awareness about how they learn and maybe the, some of their uh, differences, you know, learning, learning style differences. Um, so components of self-advocacy. Um, so knowledge of self. So knowing more about who you are, how you learn, um, and some of the, maybe the, the differences or challenges that you face in your learning. Um, knowledge of the laws. Now, obviously, uh, not so much for our, our little guys, but for parents and for maybe our, our, our upper middle school and high school students, understanding that they have rights, especially as they, when they leave um, to go to college, their understanding of their legal rights with their disabilities and the laws around that, that safeguard and protect those um, and uh, uh, the, the the, their disability and things that, that they're going to need to be successful in college and the workplace and so on. Communication skills, uh, working with our students um, uh, on how to communicate both written and an expression and interpersonal um, relationship skills that they're going to have to use to talk to teachers, to talk to employers, to talk to bosses uh, and, and working on that. Um, and that's a big part of that process. And then the leadership of that, having, you know, taking leadership um, with their own self-advocacy, and um, that's, a, that's a process that takes a long time. Um, many of our, I can think of one student at Groves as a senior, um, and having them in fourth grade, since fourth grade at Groves, the, the leadership, he's the president of the school now, president of student council, and really understands what he needs to be successful, and um, is going to Augsburg next year, and going on to do awesome, awesome things, so it's, it's definitely a journey in those components of that, so. All those areas, the self-advocacy piece is a huge part of helping prepare all of our students who are, uh, as they come in and then as they leave um, of school and, and having that terminology, using that terminology a lot is important, so. Um, I think the next slide. If, um, special education. Um, Navigating both public and private schools when your son or daughter has a learning difference, specifically learning disabilities and attention challenges can be extremely confusing, frustration, emotional, and overwhelming. So that's one of the big reasons that Groves exists in the first place. We call a lot of our students that, that in between kids. And as we go through the presentation, Ethan and I will explain how you qualify for certain areas of special education. So 
Um, a lot of our students don't necessarily qualify at Groves for special education because they didn't meet the state criteria um, ab around that. We're gonna dive deeper into that. Um, but that's a very frustrating part of our and challenges that our parents come to us is, you know, my son or daughter has dyslexia. They have um, ADHD or whatever, and they are not failing enough to get services. They are not, uh, they keep telling me that they don't qualify for services at that time, but they are not doing well. And so trying to understand that and what the state says and what, what what's this criteria and what's what's what are all these you know norm tests you're talking about and and what does that all mean and we'll kind of talk we'll talk more about that um, as the presentation goes on but it is very confusing if this if that's is not what you look at day to day and so um, not only is it confusing and frustrating it's your child so um, it's very emotional and frustrating to watch someone quote unquote fail or not do well and and people aren't necessarily giving them the help that they need um, to be successful. Very, very frustrating. So um, uh, we will dive more into that, uh, the specifics on that as we go along, so. And as we go through this, yeah, and I think there's there's been times where, where I've done presentations where um, it, it's probably been perceived or, or sounded like I've been uh, critical of, of public schools. Um, and you may hear that just a little bit as as we move through this. And, and it's not, um, you know, moving through the special education process, it, it's not an easy process, even for schools. And, and I think that there needs to be um, some consideration of that. Um, but, and, and we'll kind of try to kind of guide you along, you know, what things you can reasonably um, uh, uh, achieve and some things that might be a little bit, a little bit more difficult and each of these are gonna be specific to your needs uh, or specific to your child. Um, Colin, I also gave you access to control the screen so you can also, you should be able to push the arrow button over. Thank you um, for teaching me as well, we're all learning. Um, but th that's really, really important and, and please, I'm glad you said that, um, Ethan, because this is in no way I was a public school teacher for many, many years. This is no, um, and I understand the limitations. So this is no um, slight or slander against any any public system. We we love them and they're doing the very, very best they can, um, but they have a limited resources and that's just reality. And so uh, they can only help as many people as they can or as, as the state um, says. And so that's very important to keep in mind um, as well. So thank you for, thank you for saying that, so. Let me, uh, I'm not able, oh, there you go. Okay, um, special education. The way special education works in Minnesota, especially outside of Groves, can range significantly based on your students' specific needs, disability, school district, private versus public, socioeconomic standing, and parent involvement level. So again, you know, Groves Academy is a private school. Um, some uh, of you on this might be in the public school. Some of you might be going to a private school that could be a Catholic school, uh, which would be different than some of the other parochial schools. Um, could be different from if you're if you're if you're here from a, a, a lower school standpoint, like elementary or middle school. Um, all schools have different levels of support, um, and they look differently. And each child is very different, and they function in that space very differently as well. So. Just for an example, my children go to a, a, a language immersion school, so their support looks very different in that school as well. And so, although they're a public school, it's a charter school, um, it looks kind of different in, in every building and every situation. So, um, lots of factors to think about um, uh, in that when we talk about the levels and kinds of interventions, modifications, and adaptations in those specific uh, places. Um, and and the way that special education works in Minnesota is different from other states as well. And, and we will get this from time to time where families move in from a different state where a kid did previously qualify for special education or if students move from Minnesota out to a different state. Um, while, and we'll, we'll talk about the, the federal mandate of, of IDEA or um, IDEIA now, um, but each state is able to set up some of their own parameters around this, and that can look different as well. So that can be very confusing, and that can create some frustration for families as well. 
Good point. Absolutely. So process and overview. Um, so let's begin to explore this process and give a general overview of support services, finding the right settings, school choice environment, and what questions to ask. Remember, nobody knows your and understands your child as you do. Educating yourself around these topics will help you better advocate for your child on their educational journey. And so again, it's so important to, to reiterate is like, you know your child the best, you know if they're happy or sad, you know day to day what's going on, what they're absorbing, you have their temperature, can read the situation. So always continue to be an advocate of yourself. You can always be continue to be firm, but fair and, and, and uh, re, you know, resilient in that sense and um, continue to be politely, uh, or maybe not politely if you need to, but continue to, to be uh, very uh, involved in that system where wherever that is, whether that's the, the special education piece or the 504 piece, and we'll talk more about how that breaks down and who's responsible for those pieces in, in the, the, the school district or the private school, which is a little bit different. Um, so, um, so where do we begin? You speak to your child's teachers and administrators. So you know from your teacher conferences right away and you know as a parent um, from early on when things are going good and when they're not and when things start to change and you, you hear that in those uh, conferences and, and other things, reports. Speaking with your child's physician, if you have their concerns about learning challenges or ADHD uh, or other, or other um, any other kind of concern that you might have. Speaking with other families that you know who may have some of the same challenges. You know, when our, when our Groves families come to our school, I know one of the biggest things is for them is that, you know, other, there's other families that finally know, know them and understand who they are, understand uh, what they're going through and some of their challenges. Um, always nice to have a good network of other families or people in, uh, in your area or who understand some of the things that you're going through that you can network with them. Uh, meet with special education or the 504 coordinator to begin the process if you haven't already. So very important to make sure that you know who those people are and that you're reaching out to them and communicating uh, who they are. And there was one more bullet point. I don't know, it skipped over. Um, trying to go back. Oops, I don't know. Um, Ethan, I, I lost that last that last point, but um, so that those that, so that's that, and 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 knowing who those people are. So there you go. And uh, visit potential schools and meet their special education. Uh, coordinator and learning specialist. Very, very important to know who those people are and to get a feel of the school and get a temperature on whether that's going to be a good fit for your child, obviously. But it's important to make the time to do that. Um, a very, very worth your time. Um, and and if, if appropriate, bring your child too so that they can, they can understand uh, and get some experience being there as well. So one of as as we go through this 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 journey and, and if we're especially if we're going down uh, the special education route this this becomes a little bit more um imperative uh and it was it was just brought forth by oh, another one of our groves uh, team members who's also joined us is is the importance of having written communication as well and documentation um that can go a long way uh a lot of the times when you have verbal um, uh, information going back and forth, things get lost. Having that written record, and especially if you are requesting anything, that is going to give you much more backing. And there's going to be, and there's a lot more laws uh, that 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 will support you if you provide requests or um, or or your needs in writing. So. Uh, how you communicate and the mode of communication is, is also very, very important. Hey, and Ethan you, and Colin, um, we, have a, we have a question here, if, you, if this is a good time. Um, sure. Someone's wondering about um, if you could explain the difference between an IEP and a 504. <laughs> That's timely, isn't it? That's the next slide. Yeah. So, yeah, let's talk about IEPs versus accommodations plans. Um, so I'll, I'll start off with an IEP. So there, there is much more mandate and a lot more backing to an IEP. So this, 
really comes out of the Individuals with Disabilities uh, Education Act or IDEA. Um, and, and that's been updated. They've, they, it's now IDEIA, um, which is uh, Individuals with Disabilities uh, Education Improvement or Improvement, um, so uh, Education Act. But really this, this has provided uh, public schools and, and families um, access to special education supports when there is an identified disability. And, and there are some pretty, um, uh, I guess, strict guidelines. Uh, they, they delineate what the disabilities are and there's 13 different categories and we're gonna talk about that in the next slide as well, that, that you could potentially fit underneath. Um, and so you would need to qualify for these services and that's part of an evaluation process. And then if you qualify for these services, you would get what's called an Individualized Education Program or an IEP. And with that, you will get accommodations, you will get modifications, but one of the big separating pieces from an IEP from a, to a, from a 504 plan is you will get individualized service. And what I mean by that is, is if a child has a reading disorder, um, not only will they give accommodations like um, extended time for tests or assistive technology, but then they will also have individualized instruction for that child and goals for that child within that specific area of need. Um, and with IEPs, uh, they need to have a re they need to be reevaluated every three years. That can look a little bit different based on the child, based on the district, based on the state. Um, and an IEP is met at least yearly to update and progress reports are um, required to be sent out uh, quarterly. Now, the difference between an IEP and an, an IEP is only gonna be, it's gonna be provided by a public school. Private school students can still qualify for an IEP, but they will be serviced by the district that, uh, that supports that private school. So it'll be within uh, um, a geog ge geographical boundary. Um, and, and generally, the case is that the services will be provided at the public school. So if, if the child needs the services, they will be bust or transported over to the public school for those services. Okay, now there are some, some uh, variations to that from time to time, but uh, by far and large, that's, that's the most common uh, way that it's done. With a 504 plan, and this, was, this came out of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and this is more of a civil rights law that protects those that have a disability. And any entity that receives public funding must really adhere to a, a section 504 and must offer this. A 504 does not give you as much um, uh, protection as an IEP or, or special education but it does provide supports for an accommodation. So accommodations may be, like I said, extra time for tests, uh, being able to take tests, smaller, quieter environments. Those are probably two of the most common ones. Be, being able to access assistive technology, maybe be able, being able to um, have math tests read to them. Um, preferential seating is, is a very common one on, an, on a 504 plan. Um, now, so these are things that there's no individualized instruction for that child. They're just accommodating them and giving them some additional supports based on their disability. Now, most often when children and students transition to post-secondary, this is what's provided at that college level is their there are certain accommodations that colleges will do, um, such as extended time for tests or, or being able to take tests in a, in, a, uh, um, in, in, a, in a testing center where it's quiet, uh, or maybe like a foreign language waiver. Um, so it's, it's an accommodation. Um, so 
it's much easier to qualify for a 504 plan. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit too. Um, and, and many of those that don't qualify for an IEP can qualify for a 504. Um, a 504 is what's considered least restrictive. And that's, that's a, a, a significant term when we talk about special education and 504s is they're gonna, whenever they talk about servicing a kid, they're gonna try to put them in what's called the least restrictive environment or the environment where there's the least amount of support needed for that child to succeed. So that um, that's also meant to serve as a protection for the student that, so they're not just placed into a special education program and not a being, a, being to be with their peers. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit more about that, that 504 plan, but really you need to have, uh, you need to either have a disability that has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or major life activities. And one of those can be academics like reading, concentrating, that can impact the academics. Um, they need to have a record of such impairment or is regarded as having such an impairment. So I'm gonna explain a little bit more what that means here in the coming slides as well, um, because that gets a little bit fuzzier. Um, so both of these are gonna require some supporting documentation to qualify for special education. You will need an evaluation. Um, and that may look a little bit different based on district and or if you uh, if you've had a private evaluation done, um, it is much easier to get a 504 accommodation plan if you have a diagnosis, but you don't necessarily need a diagnosis. Okay. Um, Joanne, I saw a little thing, a few other things that flashed on my screen. Were there more questions that were coming up with regards to this one? Um, nope. I don't okay. see any others that have come my way. Okay. Um, okay. Next slide. Okay. So I, I covered a lot of this already. So an I, IEP, so an individualized education plan and in, individualized education program. So, um, so that's where you, this is if you qualify for special education. And like I said, the IEP delivers that direct service to your child. Um, an IEP will include the present levels of performance. A lot of schools will just call this the PLEP. Um, they will have measurable annual goals. Um, so when they develop their goals, uh, they, they, will have, um, they will have benchmarks that they are gonna be aiming to meet. And, and their goals will be to generally to catch the student up to their peers in their area of need. Most often that, that it'll be the case. Uh, they'll talk about the progress that has been made or not. Um, and they'll also provide a statement of services. So this is kind of a, a, a binding contract where it's saying that they're going to have this amount of time in the general education in the, in the general education environment. They're going to have this amount of time with the speech and language pathologist. They're going to have this amount of time with um, the reading disability teacher, or they might have this amount of time with this person. So um, they will also uh, talk about appropriate accommodations. So this, the accommodations piece is going to be very similar to like a 504 plan where the things that they're going to need to be to just to accommodate where they don't need the direct service. And then as children become 14 years or older, there needs to be a statement on transition. So we start planning um, for post-secondary transition um, and, and, and what that, that child needs in order to graduate and what they would need to be successful following um, um, high school. All right, looks like we have a few questions that popped in here. Um, first of all is from Marcy. And her question is, um, how do you get a 504 without a formal diagnosis? Okay, we will cover that in just a minute. So let's, Perfect. I'm going to make a note of that one. That's coming up in the coming slides. Great. And then the second question we have is, do colleges and universities take IEPs, or as I have been advised by my child's high school, to move to a 504 accommodation plan? Yes. Okay. That one's simple. Um, so... Uh, 
now, now colleges will range in, in what they provide to students. So no two colleges are the same. Um, and it is, it is also slightly dependent on whether it is a, a, a private school or, or not. If it's a public university, they are gonna be required to provide accommodations for those that may have a disability. So if they were on an IEP and they listed different accommodations, it should be fairly easy for you to get those accommodations as you move out to college. Now college, what they provide for accommodations is different from high school. Um, and, and some of the most common accommodations that you're gonna get in college are extra time, um, you know, foreign language waivers, uh, being able to take tests in smaller, quieter environments. Um, usually they're not gonna do preferential seating. Um, they kind of, uh, they say, if, if you want preferential seating, show up to class early enough. So you, you need to, in college, there's much more of an emphasis placed on you self-advocating, but they still will accommodate and provide uh, resources for those that, that need it. Okay. Um, was there other questions, Joanna? Uh, nope, that's it for now. If, if I could say really quickly, just from my own experiences, I, I, I have uh, dyslexia and ADHD and going, I went to the University of Arizona my freshman year of college and they provided, you know, going to the Disability Resource Center, you know, all my tests were at that time, because this is 1995, it was a big deal to have word processing or Windows 95, right? It was a big, big deal. And um, I was able to take my test, you know, instead of writing in the blue books, um, way back when, or the essay test, I was able to use that time, take tests, uh, preferential, um, yeah, I'm sorry, um, on time tests or, or extra time on tests. Um, my notes were taken for me by somebody else and they, I would get those the other day. Um, assistive technology at that time, so I had all my books on tape or CD, um, those kinds of things. And, and that was provided because I had an IEP, but they also looked at the, the evaluation documentation that would be from the school district or from somebody like, you know, Ethan Eck Groves or something like that, and they used that to determine the, the kinds of services, the kinds of accommodations that you would receive um, at a university, so. All right, so here are qualifying areas of an IEP. Um, so here's the, the 13 categories. Um, and, and probably the ones that are there, the most common um, are gonna be specific learning disabilities. Uh, speech language impairment, other health disabilities, emotional or behavioral disorders, and autism spectrum disorders. Now, another one that is very, very common, and it's probably the most common, is a developmental delay. And those are generally, in, in Minnesota, it's provided until a child, I think, uh, yeah, I'm a little fuzzier on this, it's either six it's or seven, eight. so it's provided. Yeah, until age eight until age eight. All right, All right. thank you. Um, and, and that is different from state to state. Um, some at six, some it's a little bit later. Um, but developmental delay uh, just means that there needs to be some delays in some areas and they provide special education. And many of those that have a developmental delay may not qualify after they're, they're, they turn age eight into these other categories. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. Um, and that's, that's meant kind of like as an early intervention category. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about specific learning disabilities and we're also gonna talk about dyslexia and how that fits in, fits in with this. Um, what I don't think that I have covered in the future slide is other health disabilities. This is probably the most common area or category that students will qualify in if they have ADHD. Now, other diagnoses can fit into this as well, um, but ADHD is, is the most common um, that fits underneath other health disabilities. I'm waiting for... So let's talk about dyslexia. And each state is a little bit different in how they address dyslexia. And um, when I was a, a school psychologist in, in Minnesota, uh, we never used the term. Um, and it was recommended that we did not. 
uh, that has changed recently, and there's been some some um, some advancements in that. Uh, and if you go to MDE's website, they actually recommend that we do use that term in in the schools now. But there isn't a separate dys dyslexia category. Dyslexia would fit underneath a specific learning disability in reading. Okay, a specific learning disability actually has eight separate subcategories. And, and one of the subcategories is basic reading skills. And, and that's really what dyslexia would fit underneath. So they may call it a learning disability with basic reading skills. And they may not actually use that term dyslexia, but it might be the exact same thing. Um, now, from what I have seen, uh, and I've seen a lot of school evaluations, they are not equipped yet and they don't have a great knowledge of assessing for dyslexia or understanding really what it fully encompasses. In January, I, uh, a colleague and, and me actually presented to um, a, a statewide uh, school psychologist uh, training on dyslexia and how to identify it. and and even those that are well seasoned, you know, really don't have a good understanding of it. So that hopefully there is some ground that's, that's made in that here in the future. Um, now, one of the big things that schools, a lot of times they will not do is they won't assess spelling, which is a huge part of dyslexia. So if your child is being assessed for a learning disorder, and if you suspect dyslexia, make sure that they assess spelling and you can request that and they should adhere to that. Um, any questions on the dyslexia piece? Okay. Nothing's coming through. Okay. So now we're going to get into the accommodations plan, and I think you're going to uh, you're going to start with this one, right, Colin? Yes, thank you. So accommodations plan. So um, uh, this, um, again, the difference between IEP and 504 and accommodations plan. So 504 plan is a public school or, or accommodation plan right, is a private school. So a lot of times, for example, you know, a lot of the, the, the schools that, are, that our students go to, um, if it's not a public school, they call them different things. Many times it's, it's some kind of accommodations plan, success plans, things like this, but you, you will hear most commonly it referred to as an accommodations plan in, in another private school. They don't have to follow necessarily the 504 guidelines, but they do have to adhere um, to, um, to, to making a, a accommodations that are reasonable. So it, but they're all a written statement um, uh, of accommodations for your student. So like Ethan was saying in, in, in the other slides, you know, common accommodations that you're gonna see a lot, um, extra time on tests, preferential seating, testing in a separate room, shortened or modified homework assignments, that may or may not happen. That's more of a modification than an accommodation, um, but that could be an accommodation depending sort of what lens you're looking at it uh, for and then why, what, why you're requesting that. Breaking down larger assignments into smaller steps could be one too. Copy of lecture notes, um, audio books, uh, use of a personal computer. So I like to think of accommodations that are a list of things or a list of, um, of, re of resources that a student could have to level the playing field uh, with their learning challenge or difference. So what's going to give them the opportunity to learn, achieve, participate, along the, all their other peers in that in their classroom. So they should be able to, to kind of level that playing field. Assistive technology is a great example of leveling that playing field so that they can participate and, and show what they know um, and participate fully. We, we have an assistive technology specialist here at Groves Academy and he has, um, in the past, he's used a, a, an analogy of, of classes. Uh, like for someone that needs glasses, that kind of levels that playing field. Um, and, and it's really kind of like an accommodation. It's, it's almost like an assistive technology that with the glasses, they're able to then 
be with their peers and work and, and achieving at the same level, but without their glasses, they're kind of lost. That's kind of what these accommodations do is it's to provide a, a, a little bit better support for those that have a little bit more of a challenge in some area um, to, to have more success. It's a great, that's a great example. Thank you for saying that. That's very, um, I think it clearly shows what, what students need to live the invisible quote unquote the invisible disability that they have. And so um, yeah. thank you for sharing that. So and we're still going to get to that question on how do we get to that 504. So, so um, know that, that we aren't uh, um, missing that. Um, so coming back and we're kind of going back and forth between IEPs and 504s. So many of these pieces within this slide we've already talked about. Um, with an IEP, students will have a disability. When you qualify for an IEP, that's pretty much, you meet that state criteria saying that there is a disability. There is almost always a comprehensive evaluation. In Minnesota, they will do, um, in Minnesota, they have criteria that you need to meet. When you first qualify, they call it that in, an initial evaluation. So there's pretty strict parameters that you need to meet to qualify for for an IEP initially. Now, after you have met that initial criteria and you stay within that system, you don't need to meet all that criteria every single time when you're re-evaluated. Uh, they have a little bit more leniency built into that, uh, which is actually very nice. So that, that's kind of mean that the IEP is working. If we're catching ground on, on, my, on our peers, um, we may not have as big of needs, but we still may have a need. Now, where this is, and, and I alluded to this earlier, um, when, a, when a student comes in out of state, uh, and this is a tricky thing in Minnesota, and this, this, is thing that, this is a thing that stinks, even if they were on IEP in a different state and they come into Minnesota, they must meet initial criteria in Minnesota. So many times what will happen is they won't meet that initial criteria because they've had all these supports earlier. And that's when you want to consider a 504 plan. Um, we already talked about anybody that needs special education, they will develop an, uh, an individualized education program and that will outline the unique needs and give them the goals. Um, and parents, as part of that, uh, the guidelines with an IEP, parents are not only a critical, but a mandated partner in every phase of identifying for special education and within the IEP, uh, you have a lot of parental rights as you move through this. Um, sometimes it may be good to have an advocate with you or, or uh, talking with an advocate um, because sometimes um, you may be unaware of, of all the, the, the rights that you may have. And, and it, can be, um, it can be tricky and, and sometimes it can be a little bit in, intimidating. Uh, I've sat on the other side of the table where I was part of the school district and um, we would have evaluation results where we would have, you know, five or six representatives of the school and we want to be, you know, make sure, making sure that, that everyone that was working with the student, you know, was able to share progress, but for a parent coming in, that can be intimidating sometimes. Uh, Ethan, it, it looks like we have a question popping up here. Um, yes. Wondering about the difference between qualifying versus clinical diagnoses. Okay. And that is a that is a very um, that's a tricky um, that that is a tricky question. There's multiple layers to that, but I think the best example that I can is I can give is. I could talk about ADHD or I could talk about dyslexia. Um, when we make a clinical diagnosis, uh, we make a diagnosis um, in the United States, we largely use um, the, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual or the DSM uh, fifth edition. And they give guidelines on how, on the different criteria for different disorders. Those are called clinical diagnoses. So, for example, when we diagnose dyslexia, you need to have significant deficits in, um, in word reading, decoding, and spelling. 
across all three areas. And it kind of gives a guideline on what a significant deficit is, is, uh, is what that means. And there's a few other guidelines. Now an IEP is set forth by, like I said, the, the federal government and, and their, are, their criteria can be a little bit different um, in the state of Minnesota, they largely use, to qualify for a learning disorder, they largely use what's called the discrepancy model, where it needs to be, there needs to be a large enough discrepancy between a student's IQ and their academic achievement. And for a clinical diagnosis, they've gotten rid of this um, uh, severe discrepancy. So a clinical diagnosis, and I don't want to say that it's more lenient, um, but it is a little bit more updated on the research um, and, and what really encompasses a learning disorder. And it, it may actually be a little bit easier to qualify for a clinical diagnosis than, than within, a, uh, within a learning disorder in school. Um, with, that, with that said, even if you have a clinical diagnosis, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to get services or you're going to qualify for an IEP, you must meet the IEP guidelines. And, and that can be frustrating and, and difficult uh, for families. Um, and, and what I've experienced, um, one of the things that we have at Groves is we have a team that, that, that kind of knows the IEP process and, and, and is better. We're not perfect with this, but we're able to tell families whether or not they would probably qualify for an IEP or not. Um, a lot of other places just make a blanket statement to, to uh, for they tell families, hey, you should go look at trying to get an IEP. And a lot of times the, the need is not significant enough and you're just going to be banging your head against a wall uh, and creating more frustration than's needed. Um, I hope that answers that question. Is there a follow-up question to that? I, I hope I answered that um, thoroughly. Uh, no follow-up. You got it. <laughs> This is, uh, this is uh, um, it's definitely a little bit different doing this from, from remote and not just being able to see someone raise their hand. Um, also, with, so the other, the other um, uh, example I was gonna talk about is ADHD. And, and this is the, for, to qualify underneath other health disabilities, one of the things you can have is ADHD. They cannot diagnose that in school, and they in, in Minnesota anyways, and they have to send the uh, child and the family elsewhere to get a diagnosis. And, and that may come from your, your pediatrician, it may come from a psychologist, it can, and there's a few others that can do it. It can also come from um, a, a licensed clinical social worker or a registered nurse. Um, and I, I think that, uh, was was everyone that, that can make the diagnosis. Um, so you need to get that clinical diagnosis in order for you to qualify underneath OHD. So there is a little bit of a bridge there sometimes that that in certain instances that that uh, that diagnosis is needed for the special education program. Um, and I think I've covered almost everything on this slide already. Um, see if there's anything else that I really need to cover. Now, one, we do have a link on the bottom of this website or on the, on the bottom of this slide. Uh, in the state of Minnesota, they do a pretty good job of, of talking about different things and different rights that you have underneath special education within their website. Um, and, and here's one link that will, that will really get you started. Um, and help you understanding that the process. Um, and we do also have a couple other resources as we move through this. Um, Colin, would, did you have anything to, to add? No, I think you covered it too. And I think it's it's important though that that's that that important criteria and and the and the person's question is is, is duly noted is you know a student may have dyslexia or reading disorder but not qualify for school services and that's where the frustration comes with many of our students. Um, who can't who come and then leave also groves is that they still you know um, um, uh, have a uh, 
a difficult time understanding why their student um, isn't going to uh, get services or continuous services. Um, it's just really, really hard when they are struggling and when they have a diagnosis and they have, you know, proven over time um, they're failing, but they're not failing enough. And then the, the again, the, the state and the school district has their own interpretation of who qualifies and, and, and what standards that they meet. Although they're all the same, certain school districts will look at things like grades and other things differently. Um, so there's a little bit of in, uh, up for interpretation there. And that can be really frustrating and challenging. Um, and, and I'm gonna muddy the water just a little bit now. Um, and this is where I'm gonna be a little bit more critical. And I think you brought up a very good point, Colin. And this was one of the things that I uh, that always frustrated me. Sometimes kids won't qualify. They'll meet all other, they'll meet all criteria for a diagnosis, but they might be a straight A or, or an A and B student. And they're saying, well, it's not having a huge educational impact. So they won't qualify for the kid, the kid for special education supports. And sometimes even not for a 504 because their grades are good. And, and that to me is just, um, and not even just to me, that, that's just an absurd way to, to look at things. Um, a lot of times grades can be subjective. Um, and, and I've worked with students and families. I've, I've worked with, I, there's one uh, girl that I can remember very clearly who would come home and she would work seven to eight hours at night doing her homework. She had no social life. She had no, she wasn't able to join any clubs or anything because she was such a slow reader and she was a straight A student because of all the work ethic that she, her, she was just an outstanding worker, but she had to take some, make so many sacrifices and they wouldn't qualify her because she was straight A. And it's, sometimes there is a very narrow and restricted look uh, at, at a student within schools. Um, and this is, Colin said this, er, um, earlier as, you, as parents know their child's the best, uh, uh, their children the best, and, and that's where you might need a little bit of support. The other thing that, that I'm gonna muddy the water with is many times schools are not super great at evaluating for special education services. Um, they, they have their list of tests that they use, and this is the test I use for this kid all the time. Uh, they don't know the research behind that test, and they don't fully evaluate what might encompass uh, a, a learning disorder. They, they try to check the boxes that fit the, uh, the criteria that set forth by the state, um, and, and they're doing the child and the family and, and the school a disservice by not being as comprehensive. And my critique there uh, is, I need to qualify it a little bit is they're not really trained to do that well. And, and that frustrates me. And, and, you know, some of it, uh, it's not underneath their control. Um, but, but uh, the system can, that, that creates a system that is very hard to navigate at times. So along with that, if you have a child and you are wondering, and, and this is one of the things we do at Groves and we do this for free, if you've had a child that that was evaluated and did not qualify, or if you have a question on something, you can forward us along the evaluation, and I'd be happy to take a look at that um, and, and help provide any guidance that I may have. Um, so, so that's something that that um, we can help with a little bit. Um, looks like we have a question here, Ethan. Yes. Um, it says, "How do you get a 504 for undiagnosed ADHD?" That's all right. So we're going into the 504s right now. And then that, that fits in very well with that other question, too, is that there's not a diagnosed. Um, so we talked about with an, with an IEP, they have a pretty comprehensive evaluation process. Uh, to qualify for a 504, you also need to do, and I'm doing a little bit of a quote, an evaluation process as well. But an evaluation process for a 504, what, what the definition of their evaluation process is a lot different from, a, from, a, from an IEP. Um, so generally it, it is easier if you have a diagnosis, but if you are regarded as having a disability and that, that means that you don't really need to have a disability, but if you have all these weaknesses that are present, 
you can request to look at a 504 and the evaluation will include generally a 504 coordinator, which that can be different from building to building. It might be a principal, it might be uh, a social worker, it might be a, um, it might actually be a 504 coordinator. It depends on the school. There'll probably be classroom teachers and you can be asked to be involved with that too. But, but with a 504, the parents don't have as many rights as they do underneath the, that IEP. And their evaluation would be to sit down and talk about what are the areas of weakness that are affecting this child and would in a 504 plan be appropriate? So it's, it's really kind of, a, of an informal evaluation process. Now, many schools, they will uh, erroneously say that you need to have a disability and they don't understand the law very well. And it's right online. You can find that the information that you do not need to have a disability, you, you need to either have a disability have had a disability or be regarded as having a disability. Um, so um, if there are significant attention concerns, so if it's undiagnosed ADHD, the school is probably gonna say, well, why don't you go to your pediatrician and, and get evaluated and, and, and get that formal diagnosis? And, and to a degree, I, I agree with that a little bit. Um, because most insurance will cover that and and it it better documents that there is the presence of, of a disability there. Um, but you could also request a meeting and say, these are all the things that my child is struggling with. And, and if you have teachers that also say that, you might be able to develop that 504 plan without that formal diagnosis. And Ethan was saying, it's I, I think it's having that documentation from teachers, from you know, from other, uh, from you, from other teachers, and saying that this is documented that this is a continual challenge. This is interfering from him or her doing well and and uh, and uh, participating and, and holding them back fully or, or as best they could in the general education setting. And so they do need these this accommodations or are these a few sets of accommodations um, to help them be more successful um, and, and having that uh, that documentation is helpful as well so yes um, Kim Ani is is uh, in this uh, in, in this uh, presentation with us and and she she's gave me a little chat message and, and said and, and raised up a very good point so if you ever have any meeting, or, or have uh, anything that's involving your student, not only you know, keep a track record and documentation and follow things up with writing, but if there's any meeting, make sure that you follow up that meeting with say, you know, this is what we agreed upon, this is what the action plan is. So you follow up with an email that's written so that you make sure that, that you also have that paper trail to make sure that, that, um, that expectations are clear and then it makes it easier for you to follow up on those and MDE has some good checklists there Minnesota Department of Education for you to to um, to use that resource and then I'm seeing I see I got another chat okay so Colin do you want to take this one He's, oh, Colin, you're muted. I'm sorry. So we've gone through the 504 plan, but I will kind of go through this quickly and, and just talk a little bit more about that. And, and Ethan will uh, will pepper in a little bit. So who qualifies for a 504 plan? 504 plans are for K-12 public school students. Yeah, let me go back, I'm sorry. Um, okay, when doing a 504 uh, evaluation for the school considers and, and information from several sources, including documentation of a child's disability, such as a doctor's note, evaluation results, um, observation, if you had an IEP and it, they didn't qualify, observation by teachers and parents, like we talked about, academic records, obviously they'll look through those, independent evaluations, if you have those, if those are available, um, and Section 504 requires evaluation uh, procedures that prevent students from being misclassified 
incorrectly labeled as having a disability or incorrectly placed. So that's important too. So. Um, it looks like we have a question here about 504 plans. Um, it says, when working with the 504 coordinator, are suggested accommodations usually tried out before building the formal plan, or should you already have an idea of what accommodations your child might need? Ethan, I, think I, that is, yeah. my, I think my answer is yes. Yeah. To both parts. I, I don't think that there is a... Um, I, th I think either way you will pro so so if you want to try out some accommodations you probably are if you're going that route and the school is asking you and I could I, I haven't heard of a school doing that but it's it seems reasonable um, but even in that regard you probably have some ideas of some accommodations that may work um, but I think Anytime you have a 504 meeting or you meet with this, the team is going to have some ideas of what accommodations are going to work. Mm -hmm. And you can go to Google and you can you can um, type in common school evaluate or school accommodations. And we we listed some of the general ones here. You will find lots of, of resources out there that that talk about different accommodations that you could use. Maybe some that we didn't list here. Um, so I don't think that there is a I don't think that either way that 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 question was posed either way I think would work in developing that 504. Colin do you have anything to add or no I would totally agree with that and you know obviously they're going to make sure that they want wants to what you're asking for is going to match you know their their challenges or disabilities or whatever and you know sometimes it, you, you really want to boil down to you know I like to tell families depending but you really want to boil down to the to the to the nugget the five six seven that you really need um, and then you can shoot for the moon from there but um, you know I think when you present something that's reasonable and rational like these are the, the three five seven things that they need to be successful those, those I think feel um, doable and understandable and uh, for the for the whatever school district that you're at having those uh, you know, pages and, and lists of accommodations is sometimes overwhelming and, and how am I going to integrate all this, but having something that's really boiled down um, and uh, really represents what you're looking for and what they're going to need to, 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 to be successful in their classroom. And, uh, and it's going to look different probably in each classroom, but to have those uh, is really important uh, um, in that sort of that nugget, those, those three to five to seven things. All right. With, with a 504 plan and with an IEP, uh, a 504 plan is generally going to be reviewed every year. Now you can, re and also with an IEP, you can request the plan to be review reviewed or updated. Really, either one of these plans should be fluid. And they should be able to be, and, and a 504 plan is a little, probably a little bit more fluid than an IEP. But a good district and a good team, they're going to adjust to your child's needs. And you may be trying something that doesn't work and you may need to adjust it and make an amendment. Or you may be finding some new things that are coming out that you want to add in. Um, so really, um, I think we need to be flexible for those that have disabilities, whether you do a 504 plan or an IEP. So, and I think that that's important as well. Okay. Looks like we have one more question coming in, um, kind of related to all of our homeschooling situations at the moment. Um, how can families advocate to uphold their plans during this time of distance learning? That's a great question. Um, I would always have your, your um, you know, Kimani, uh, our, she's our, um, has been at growth for a long time. She's our director of, of transitions, uh, transition advocate. She says, always have you, you know, always have your 504 
plan a handy and have it there and be able to communicate that to the teachers and reminding teachers um, and, and administrators if you need to at that school that um, that's what they that's what they need. So if, if a teacher is not following through with accommodations or or, or whatever is outlined in that document uh, in a fair and friendly way, I would definitely remind them. And if they're not following through, uh, remind them again and keep all that in documentation and get an administrator uh, involved. Uh, what we call the special uh, ed due process facilitator, which is sort of the person who's in charge of special ed at that school, um, and then go up from there if you're not getting. Um, any feedback or any any uh, if you're not getting any traction so um, same goes with IEPs as well if people aren't if they're not getting the service hours that they um, that they that they need definitely contact those the, the teachers the case manager um, the administrators in that building and I know you know that Minnesota has been working uh, Minnesota Department Minnesota Department of Ed has been working on that. I know my my child, for example, my oldest gets speech and language services and he gets them once a week and they're providing that um, through Zoom, the same time, same amount of times per week uh, via Zoom uh, and, and that's uh, weekly. So um, so that's, that's, how, that's how we've been uh, working through that with him as well. And I think Colin brought up some really good points. Um, and even when a plan is in place, uh, there might be multiple reasons why something's not being followed through on. And, and I think it's always good to reflect on that. You know, sometimes, you know, that, that is unintentional. And we hear quite often, and it is, you know, at an elementary age, um, when you have one teacher that's kind of in charge of the student and, and they're, they're probably a little bit better at being able to manage 504 plans and making sure that uh, the student is leaving for special education and, and uh, to their services when they're needed to be. Um, when, they, when students start getting into middle school and high school, when they have multiple teachers, and so like one science teacher could have, you know, 150, 200 students and trying to keep track of all those 504 plans, I mean, it is a daunting task. And and so there, there will be times where there are bumps in there and, and a little bit of leeway or friendly reminders and, and just advocating for your child um, is, is, is going to be important as well. And just, hey, you know, uh, you know, dropping a little note to them and, and uh, acknowledging even how busy they are too. That's what I'll say. So... So this also gets into that question, uh, who develops that 504 plan? Um, so uh, as children get older and even with IEPs, they'll start, uh, a lot of the times they'll start having students be involved with IEPs. And many districts will have a student led IEP. Um, and th those are really cool and neat to see, especially when uh, the child is pretty mature and has a good understanding and they tell you what they need. That's, that's really neat to see. Um, that doesn't always happen, um, but um, these are people that are generally involved with that 504 development, um, and and uh, I would I would request that that uh, as a parent that that you are involved with it if you are going to develop a 504 plan, and most districts are going to be very very accommodating to that. Um, um, they want to be uh, had that contact with the family and, and develop the best plan. Um, so, uh, and, and again, I put that request in writing. So I would like to be involved with part of this team in developing this. So, okay. And we talked about this a little bit. So at a 504 planning meeting, so this is that evaluation I was talking about. So there, you know, we're going to talk about the child's strengths. We're going to talk about suggestions what accommodations are needed, what assistive technology is recommended, what modifications. Um, so they may propose changes to the 504 plan. Um, so, um, and then there are times where it even may be appropriate to discontinue an accommodation plan or, um, or an IEP. So there, there are times where, where kids graduate uh, from these plans and, and that, that that 
is a, a good point in time too. That's, that's awesome if that happens. Now, one other thing that I wanna bring up with 504s though. Um, now, you also may have, have teachers, and, and we, we hear this a lot, especially in the elementary ages, that you know, my child has ADHD or my child has a learning disorder, and my teacher is doing a phenomenal job of accommodating for our kid, and we haven't developed a 504 plan. I would develop a 504 plan even if you have a teacher that is amazing in doing so and accommodating. And the biggest reason I recommend that is, is not really for a, a um, um, to, to make sure that things are followed through, not, not to, to double check on things. It's more for down the road. We know with like when you get to an ACT or SAT, having a paper trail available makes all the difference for, for getting those uh, extended time on those high stakes tests. So, if you can continue to have that paper trail in place, that's going to help you if that child, if your child needs those services down the road. Looks like we have another question that popped up. Um, it's from Allison. It says, would you be willing to give us a brief understanding of what a child with dyslexia's IEP might request for support? What kinds of accommodations have proven to be most effective? And how about for ADHD, since they often go together as they do in my child? Good question for dyslexia. So if we're talking about the goals, the goals should be targeting the, 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 the deficits that are very inherent to dyslexia. So at an early age, we're gonna be working on those early reading skills. We're gonna be working on decoding. We're gonna be working on word reading. We're gonna be working on spelling. Uh, hopefully they have an evidence-based um, um, program to address those. Uh, like the Minnetonka district, uh, a lot of the students uh, participate in the Wilson program. It's phenomenal that they have that. But if they have a, a program that's multi-sensory that really addresses the, those early reading skills, that's going to be uh, very, uh, it's going to be imperative. As the child transitions and gets older, we might be working more on fluency. Um, and we might also be addressing some of the comprehension. Um, Accommodations for dyslexia. We're going to be talking about many of the things that we talked extra time for tests because many times uh, students with dyslexia, as they grow older, they're able to, to many kids will do okay with comprehension. It just takes them a lot longer to read through the material. Um, and that's not always the case, but, but sometimes that is. And so a lot of times it's going to be extra time being able to take tests in smaller quality environments. That's going to be very important for someone with ADHD as well. Uh, other accommodations for ADHD may be preferential seating. Uh, it may be uh, uh, checks for clarification. So making sure that the teacher checks in with your student, make sure that they understand the directions, make sure that they understand when the timelines are due. Uh, you may have a check in person that they check in on a daily basis to make sure that they have got their daily planner completed, that they've got um, their assignment notebook and, and they're turning stuff in. Um, so that might be a, a very good accommodation. Uh, for assistive technology, we're going to talk about um, a, 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 uh, a audio book type of program for those with dyslexia. Um, for those with ADHD, we might talk about online calendars, being able to take uh, audio recordings of, of classes, maybe having a note taker, being provided copies of notes before lectures. Um, I probably went through some of those pretty fast. Um, Colin, would you, what would you add? I, I would, I think you covered it all. Um, you know, and, and again, it's specific to that child too, but I think you did a great job covering all of those uh, common, you know, common ones that we would recommend and that we that we do, that come across. Other questions. I think we're kind of reaching towards the end of our presentation. Um, other resources that you can have. This is really good. Um, you can request to have a mediator. Uh, you can re request uh, to go into mediation with the district uh, when you don't have a 504 plan or an IEP. Mm -hmm. 
it's always good to ask and, and note your, your asks beforehand and see if you can solve it without a mediator. You can also use resources such as PACER. PACER is a great uh, advocacy uh, place that can help you guide you through the special education or a little bit with that 504 uh, plan as well. Um, and then um, also uh, there's a website called Rights Law. Uh, that is a phenomenal website and Wright is W-R-I-G-H-T. Uh, and this is a lawyer that, that knows so much about special education has many resources that are available for you uh, to help you through that. Okay. That's important as being the advocate piece and knowing the law and we looked at the first slide when we talked about the law is really understanding that and, 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 and trying to understand as best you can and or getting people um, can help you if you're running against uh, some roadblocks and if you think that they're not uh, giving you the services that you, that you need is to be uh, an advocate and know the law, um, as Ethan is saying. So. Yes, uh, most, most I'm getting a message from Kim, most you know, districts do want to avoid um, litigation. And so uh, not that you have to go and be a bull in a china shop, but be persistent, pleasantly persistent, I like to say, um, and uh, continue to advocate. Um, um, yeah, and it's okay to question. So thank you, Kim, for that too. It is okay and, to question um, um, and to, to try to understand more and to, and to ask why and have them justify that to you. Um, uh, you know, being the squeaky wheel is, is okay. It's good, so. And it, it may get to a point where you do, and, and, and I hope this does never happen to any of you, it may get to a point where you do need to do or go into litigation and going into a lawsuit. Um, and we've had a few kids uh, that have attended Groves Academy that, um, or that have, that I've worked with and consulted with where that's, that's been where it actually landed on. And, and um, sometimes the district does not budge and hopefully you never get there. And then right. generally by the time you're done with the lawsuit and you get everything squared away, um, what you were asking for, it's already too late for those to be implemented. So right. hopefully what you're doing is gonna be helping another student along their journey. Absolutely. Looks like we have a question that popped up here. Um, it says, oh, uh, and now I lost it. One second. <laughs> um, can a tutor be included in an IEP, at least right now during distance learning? Absolutely, you have the right, they'll, uh, you can you can have anyone join really that IEP meeting. And you can request for them to join with you. Yes, you have that right to to ask for some to join with you. And then a second question: It says, when does our child get a 504 or an IEP from Groves? So for current parents. So that's a good question too, and that's um, what uh, Kimani can help us with as they transition to. Um, you know, Groves is a private school, so uh, everything that we do is based um, uh, on in you know, other their their dis their disability or the diagnostic reports that we have. So it's again, it's a private school. We don't have to follow all the other mandates, um, and we just we just guide um, and assist them as they transition. That's what Kim helps to do. We guide and, and assist um, their tr as they transition. Uh, to uh, and from Groves, um, help them to figure out where they're going, whether it's a private or a public school, um, and help them to figure out uh, how to seek that accommodation plan, how to ask for it, um, and then and, and if it's a private school and a public school, uh, what documentations to bring and, and, and how uh, that might look. And so we also, if you're at Groves, we also, that's the time where you sit down with Kim and go over those things. and. She might be. She would be willing to go with the family uh, to work on that uh, and plant those seeds before uh, they transition there to the following year. So, um, does that answer? I hope that answers your, your question about um, we we would we would come up with a plan together. If you were a Groves student, if you were there, uh, look at the evaluation. Look at what the teachers are currently uh, using. Um, and looking at the documentation that we have at Groves and our Groves education plan, 
Uh, that's in our uh, that's in our um, it's in our statement in our least restrictive environment statement here and what we do and uh, what their accommodations that they're already getting at Groves and we can usually use that to translate that to where they're going hopefully. That's great. Um, looks like we have a few more questions popping up. First, um, how long does it usually take to get an IEP or a 504 for your child? Um, it depends. Uh, it depends um, what school district you're in. Um, uh, yeah, as Kim said, longer than you expect. So um, once you once you request that, so you can get an IEP in a couple of ways. It could come through the team from the teacher, from the parent requesting it. If a if a teacher, um, 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 they they'll only start an IEP if they go to a new school. Um, they'll begin the process after six weeks. They need documentation. They need time to go through um, the the school year and and uh, figure out some uh, where your where the child is at. And they need to to show uh, have documentation to see how the school year is going and if they're struggling. Um, they need time to do interventions uh, on their own. And then if things aren't go still aren't going well, then they might start the IEP process there. A, a, a parent also has to write. Um, you know, the earlier the earlier you do that, the better, and you request that. If a parent puts in writing that they would they formally request their child to um, get special education services, then they need to follow that, and they have a timeline to do that. Um, but um, Ethan can talk more, probably more about that too. Um, but again, earlier is the better. Putting it in writing, as he said before, is key. So, uh, and there is a mandated timeline for that too. So. And so, and, and some things are, so if you, if you request an evaluation, and so this is, this is a tricky part in the state of Minnesota, they have to respond to your written request within a reasonable, and that's the term, reasonable amount of time. Um, now, generally the rule of thumb is that it's gonna be about two weeks and they still have the right to say that, no, they're not gonna move forward with the evaluation. Um, but um, once you start with the evaluation timeline, there's a lot more, if they agree to do the evaluation, things kick in and there's a lot more um, uh, stricter timelines that, that need to be followed. Um, <clears throat> with a 504, I think it's, a, it's much easier and you'll probably have a much faster response. Um, and if you are looking at developing an IEP, developing a 504 first may make sense because you're providing some of those accommodations, you're providing a little bit of a buffer there before you start jumping in. And then you, while you're waiting for that IEP to be developed, you have a little bit of a buffer there. Well, there was a question. Um, if we already have an IEP for a 10th grader, would there be a need to convert to a 504 for college prep? The short answer is no. Sometimes that can be helpful. And this is, this is based on the needs of your child. The benefits of moving to a 504 would be that you'd be putting more onus on the child and having them, you'd be wanting to develop their own self-advocacy skills which they're gonna to need to use when they move off to college anyways. So it depends on the maturity level of your child and depends on, on, on the 504 plan, but it could make sense to move from, a, from an IEP to a 504 so they get used to that and still have a little bit of parent support to help guide them through that before they make that jump to college. Looks like there's a follow-up question um, to the previous one around involving a tutor in the IEP process um, as sort of a clarification. Um, it says what I was trying to ask was if a tutor can be included as part of an IEP plan now during distance learning. So not like part of the meeting, but as like part of the solution, I guess. Oh, uh, probably not. Um, most likely not because when they provide the special education supports, it needs to be, there's mandates that the, that the school has to do. It has to be provided by a licensed special education learning disability teacher. 
So unless your tutor is one of those, and even if they are, the district may want to use their licensed staff member um, that they had jurisdiction or they have a little bit of, of say over. So, so having the tutor be a part of the IEP, that's probably not gonna fly. Yeah, like like um, Ethan was saying, they're going to want to be able to, con they're going to want that tutor or that person to be a school employee because they're going to want to be able to have control over that. They're going to want to be able to, um, um, you know, dictate what happens and what kind of services um, are being provided um, and the 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 amount of time and all those kinds of things. So they're paying for it and they're going to have they're going to want to be able to control that. Um, you know, there are paraprofessionals and those kinds of things. Again, this is a new territory for me, so I don't know how those are being spread out. And, and so you could potentially, for example, one of my own personal uh, uh, children um, is on an IEP. So then he has access to, uh, we, had, we requested more time. So he's going to meet with a paraprofessional um, twice a week now. But again, it depends on the the district and, and his the IEP and when, what their resources are they have available. So that's a really hard question to answer, but uh, not. I would say it's worth your time checking in with, if they're on an IEP and talking with their case manager first, starting there and saying what you need and then justifying your need and seeing if there are re additional resources that you can access. All right, looks like we have one last question that came in here. It says, any suggestions for a middle schooler who doesn't want to use her accommodations while at school because she doesn't want to look different? That's a good question. Um, I would just say, just for my example or of being an assistant head of school and talking with kids, and that's why I start off with the presentation with the advocacy piece is, you know, understanding what that feels like personally as someone you know, in the mid '80s and late in in late nine or early '90s, with someone, you know, not wanting to look different. Um, you know, just having a real honest conversation uh, with your child, and it does take time. And and Ethan was saying it depends on your, you know, student's maturity level whether you want to take them off the IP and put them on a 504. It totally depends on each kid is going to act and behave differently. Each school is going to have different. Uh, environments and communities a feeling of what that looks like at our at our school it might be a lot different because all the kids are are there for very specific reasons but I think talking with them very plainly about how um, they need to be able to use those and, and get a company uh, uh, sorry accustomed to that and just knowing that there's nothing absolutely nothing wrong with with using accommodations to level the playing field so that they can fully participate and begin to advocate for yourself. And again, middle school is really hard for everybody, right? Even if you're what we call totally neurotypical, right? And But um, having those hard conversations now um, is really important and it's not gonna be perfect and some days are gonna be better than others, but uh, to really kind of show uh, them and talk with them how to stand up for themselves and not shy away from it and be proud of it um, is a journey, but to kind of continue to have those conversations every day. Um, that's a really good question, that's hard. Um, but being someone that I, I didn't want anyone to know when I was their age either, and I would go to great lengths to, to kind of hide it until I was older. So uh, easy for me to say, harder to do, you know, so. I don't know if that totally answered your question. I hope it gave you some perspective, but, um, uh, that's a that's a really the, the emotional social part of that is you know having a learning difference is is just as hard challenging you know act, you know cognitively as it is emotional and social like we all are right I mean learning we know is so much social emotional think about if you have a fight with your spouse or your bandwidth or whatever that day is going to be significantly impacted because you're thinking about that most of the day so in a middle school situation when when everything is really hard to begin with um, and then having that on top of it. So not easy, but then also letting them have space to acknowledge that and be frustrated with it and be angry about it certain days and then how to recover from that um, and, and talking open, open, openly and honestly is important, so.
All right, any other last thoughts or questions? We did include our emails. Um, Colin has graciously accepted to take all emails. <laughs> Absolutely. No, um, uh, kidding aside, if you have questions uh, later on or if, there, if we didn't come to something uh, or if you have very specific questions, yeah. uh, please feel free to reach out to us. For sure. And we will be sending out a copy of the presentation to everyone. So check your email for that. And also, this is the first time we've done this on Zoom. So we want your feedback. Um, we'll send you a link for a survey about how we did, what um, went well, what you think we can do better. So please fill it out. And thank you so much, everybody, for coming tonight and taking time out of your night. Thank you, everybody.